You're listening to Morning Short, the podcast that brings you one great short story every morning. Available on listen.morningshort.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, and any podcast app. Today's story is Skeleton Lake, an episode in camp by Algernon Blackwood. Before we start, I have a question for you. Have you tweeted your personal invite link to Morning Short yet? Share great stories and earn Morning Short prizes. Get your link at share.morningshort.com. And now, to the story. The utter loneliness of our moose camp on Skeleton Lake had impressed us from the beginning. In the Quebec backwoods, five days by trail and canoe from civilization, and perhaps the singular name contributed a little to the sensation of eeriness that made itself felt in the camp circle, when once the sun was down and the late October mists began rising from the lake and winding their way in among the tree trunks. For in these regions, all names of lakes and hills and islands have their origin in some actual event, taking either the name of a chief participant, such as Smith's Ridge, or claiming a place in the map by perpetuating some special feature of the journey or the scenery, such as Long Island, Deep Rapids, or a Rainy Lake. All names thus have their meaning and are usually pretty recently acquired, while the majority are self-explanatory and suggest human and pioneer relations. Skeleton Lake, therefore, was a name full of suggestion, and though none of us knew the origin or the story of its birth, we all were conscious of a certain lugubrious atmosphere that haunted its shores and islands, and but for the evidences of recent moose tracks in its neighborhood, we should probably have pitched our tents elsewhere. For several hundred miles in any direction we knew of only one other party of whites. They had journeyed up on the train with us, getting in at North Bay and hailing from Boston Way. A common goal and object had served by way of introduction, but the acquaintance had made little progress. The noisy, aggressive Yankee did not suit our fancy much as a possible neighbor. And it was only a slight intimacy between his chief guide, Jake the Swede, and one of our men that kept the thing going at all. They went into camp on Beaver Creek, fifty miles and more to the west of us. But that was six weeks ago, and seemed as many months, for days and nights pass slowly in these solitudes, and the scale of time changes wonderfully. Our men always seem to know by instinct pretty well, where the mother fells was moving. But in the interval, no one had come across their trails, or once so much as heard their rifle shots. Our camp consisted of the professor, his wife, a splendid shot and keen woodswoman, and myself. We had a guide apiece and hunted daily in pairs from before sunrise till dark. It was our last evening in the woods and the professor was lying in my little wedge tent discussing the dangers of hunting alone in couples in this way. The flap of the tent hung back and let in fragrant odors of cooking over an open wood fire. Everywhere there were bustle and preparation and one canoe already lay packed with moose horns, her nose pointing southwards. If an accident happened to one of them, he was saying. The survivor's story when he returned to camp would be entirely unsupported evidence, wouldn't it? Because, you see... And he went on laying down the law after the manner of professors until I became so bored that my attention began to wander to pictures and memories of the scenes we were just about to leave. Garden Lake with its hundred islands, the rapids out of Round Pond, the countless vistas of forest, crimson and gold in the autumn sunshine, and the starlit nights we had spent watching in cold, cramped positions for the wary moose on lonely lakes among the hills. The hum of the professor's voice in time grew more soothing. A nod or a grunt was all the reply he looked for. Fortunately, he loathed interruptions. I think I could almost have gone to sleep under his very nose. Perhaps I did sleep for a brief interval. Then it all came about so quickly, and the tragedy of it was so unexpected and painful, throwing our peaceful camp into momentary confusion that now it all seems to have happened with the uncanny swiftness of a dream. First, there was the abrupt ceasing of the droning voice, and then the running of quick little steps over the pine needles and the confusion of men's voices, and the next instant the professor's wife was at the tent door, hatless, her face white, her hunting bloomers bagging at the wrong places, a rifle in her hand, and her words running into one another anyhow. Quick, Harry, it's Rushton. I was asleep and it woke me. Something's happened. You must deal with it. 
In a second, we were outside the tent with our rifles. My God, I heard the professor exclaim as if he had first made the discovery. It is Rushton! I saw the guides helping, dragging a man out of a canoe. A brief space of deep silence followed in which I heard only the waves from the canoe washing up on the sand. And then, immediately after, came the voice of a man talking with amazing rapidity and with odd gaps between his words. It was Rushton telling his story, and the tones of his voice, now whispering, now almost shouting, mixed with sobs and solemn oaths and frequent appeals to the deity, somehow or other struck the false note at the very start, and before any of us guessed or knew anything at all, something moved secretly between his words, a shadow veiling the stars, destroying the peace of our little camp, and touching us all personally with an undefinable sense of horror and distrust. I can see that group to this day, with all the detail of a good photograph, standing halfway between the firelight and the darkness, a slight mist rising from the lake, the frosty stars, and our men in silence that was all sympathy, dragging Russian across the rocks towards the campfire. Their moccasins crunched on the sand and slipped several times on the stones beneath the weight of the limp, exhausted body and I can still see every inch of that paired cedar branch he had used for a paddle on that lonely and dreadful journey. But what struck me most, as it struck us all, was the limp exhaustion of his body compared to the strength of his utterance and the tearing rush of his words. A vigorous, driving power was there at work, forcing out the tail, red, hot, and throbbing, full of discrepancies and the strangest contradictions. And the nature of this driving power I first began to appreciate when they had lifted him into the circle of firelight, and I saw his face, gray under the tan, terror in the eyes, tears too, hair and beard awry, and listened to the wild stream of words pouring forth without ceasing. I think we all understood then, but it was only after many years that anyone dared to confess what he thought. There was Matt Morris, my guide, Silver Fizz, whose real name was unknown and who bore the title of his favorite drink, and huge Hank Milligan, all ears and kind intention. And there was Rushton, pouring out his ready-made tale with ever-shifting eyes, turning from face to face seeking confirmation of details none had witnessed but himself, and one other. Silver Fizz was the first to recover from the shock of the thing, and to realize, with the natural sense of chivalry common to most genuine backwoodsmen, that the man was at a terrible disadvantage. At any rate, he was the first to start putting the matter to rights. Never mind telling it just now, he said in a gruff voice, but with real gentleness. Get a bite to eat first, and then let her go afterwards. Better have a horn of whiskey, too. It ain't all packed yet, I guess. Couldn't eat or drink a thing, cried the other. Good Lord, don't you see, man? I want to talk to someone first. I want to get it out of me to someone who can answer, answer. I've had nothing but trees to talk with for three days, and I can't carry it alone any longer. Those cursed, silent trees. I've told it to them a thousand times. Now just see here. It was this way when we started out from camp. He looked fearfully about him, and we realized it was useless to stop him. The story was bound to come, and come it did. Now the story itself was nothing out of the way. Such tales are told by the dozen round any campfire where men who have knocked about in the woods are in the circle. It was the way he told it that made our flesh creep. He was near the truth all along, but he was skimming it, and the skimming took off the cream that might have saved his soul. Of course, he smothered it in words, odd words too, melodramatic, poetic, out of the way words that lie just on the edge of frenzy. Of course, too, he kept asking us each in turn, scanning our faces with those restless, frightened eyes of his. What would you have done? What else could I do? And was that my fault? But that was nothing, for he was no milk-and-water fellow who dealt in hints and suggestions. He told his story boldly, forcing his conclusions upon us as if we had been so many wax cylinders of a phonograph that would repeat accurately what had been told us. And these questions I have mentioned he used to emphasize any special point that he seemed to think required such emphasis. 
The fact was, however, the picture of what had actually happened was so vivid still in his own mind that it reached ours by a process of telepathy which he could not control or prevent. All through his true false words, this picture stood forth in fearful detail against the shadows behind him. He could not veil, much less obliterate it. We knew, and I always thought, he knew that we knew. The story itself, as I have said, was sufficiently ordinary. Jake and himself, in a nine-foot canoe, had upset in the middle of a lake and had held hands in the upturned craft for several hours, eventually cutting holes in her ribs to stick their arms through and grasp hands lest the numbness of the cold water should overcome them. They were miles from shore, and the wind was drifting them down upon a little island. But when they got within a few hundred yards of the island, they realized to their horror that they would after all drift past it. It was then the quarrel began. Jake was leaving the canoe and swimming. Russian believed in waiting till they actually had passed the island and were sheltered from the wind. Then they could make the island easily by swimming, canoe and all. But Jake refused to give in, and after a short struggle, Rushton admitted there was a struggle, got free from the canoe and disappeared without a single cry. Rushton held on and proved the correctness of his theory and finally made the island canoe and all after being in the water over five hours. He described to us how he crawled up onto the shore and fainted at once with his feet lying half in the water, how lost and terrified he felt upon regaining consciousness in the dark, how the canoe had drifted away, and his extraordinary luck in finding it caught again at the end of the island by a projecting cedar branch. He told us that the little axe, another bit of real luck, had caught in the thwart when the canoe turned over, and how the little bottle in his pocket holding the emergency matches was whole and dry. He made a blazing fire and searched the island from end to end, calling upon Jake in the darkness, but getting no answer till finally so many half-drowned men seemed to come crawling out of the water onto the rocks and vanish among the shadows when he came up with them that he lost his nerve completely and returned to lie down by the fire till the daylight came. He then cut a bow to replace the lost paddles, and after one more useless search for his lost companion, he got into the canoe, fearing every moment he would upset again, and crossed over to the mainland. He knew roughly the position of our camping place, and after paddling day and night and making many weary portages without food or covering, he reached us two days later. This more or less was the story, and we, knowing whereof he spoke, knew that every word was literally true, and at the same time went to the building up of a hideous and prodigious lie. Once the recital was over, he collapsed, and Silver Fizz, after a general expression of sympathy from the rest of us, came again to the rescue. But now, mister, you just got to eat and drink whether you have a mind to or no. And Matt Morris, cook that night, soon had the fried trout and bacon and the wheat cakes and hot coffee passing round a rather silent and oppressed circle. So we ate around the fire, ravenously, as we had eaten every night for the past six weeks, but with this difference that there was one among us who was more than ravenous, and he gorged. In spite of all our devices, he somehow kept himself the center of observation. When his tin mug was empty, Morris instantly passed the tea pail. When he began to mop up the bacon grease with the dough on his fork, Hank reached out for the frying pan, and the can of steaming boiled potatoes was always by his side. And there was another difference as well. He was sick, terribly sick, before the meal was over. And this sudden nausea after food was more eloquent than words of what the man had passed through on his dreadful, foodless, ghost-haunted journey of forty miles to our camp. In the darkness, he thought he would go crazy, he said. There were voices in the trees, and figures were always lifting themselves out of the water or from behind boulders to look at him and make awful signs. Jake constantly peered at him through the underbrush, and everywhere the shadows were moving, with eyes, footsteps, and following shapes. We tried hard to talk of other things, but it was no use, for he was bursting with the rehearsal of his story and refused to allow himself the chances we were so willing and anxious to grant him. After a good night's rest, he might have had more self-control and better judgment and would probably have acted differently, but as it was, we found it impossible to help him. Once the pipes were lit and the dishes cleared away, it was useless to pretend any longer. The sparks from the burning log zigzagged upwards into a sky brilliant with stars, 
It was all wonderfully still and peaceful, and the forest odors floated to us on the sharp autumn air. The cedar fire smelt sweet, and we could just hear the gentle wash of tiny waves along the shore. All was calm, beautiful, and remote from the world of men and passion. It was indeed a night to touch the soul, and yet I think none of us heeded these things. A bull moose might have almost thrust his great head over our shoulders and have escaped unnoticed. The death of Jake the Swede, with its sinister setting, was the real presence that held the center of the stage and compelled attention. "'You won't perhaps care to come along, mister,' said Morris by way of a beginning. "'But I guess I'll go with one of the boys here and have a hunt for it.' "'Sure,' said Hank. "'Jake and I done some biggish trips together in the old days, and I'll do that much for him. "'It's deep water, they tell me, around them islands,' added Fizz. "'But we'll find it, sure pop, if it's there.' They all spoke of the body as it. There was a minute or two of heavy silence, and then Rushton again burst out with his story in almost the identical words he had used before. It was almost as if he had learned it by heart. He wholly failed to appreciate the efforts of the others to let him off. Silver Fizz rushed in, hoping to stop him, Morris and Hank closely following his lead. I once knew another traveling partner of his, he began quickly. Used to live down Moose Jaw Rapids way. Is that so? said Hank. Kind of useful sort of feller, chimed in Morris. All the idea the men had was to stop the tongue wagging before the discrepancies became so glaring that we should be forced to take notice of them and ask questions. But just as well try to stop an angry bull moose on the run or prevent Beaver Creek freezing in midwinter by throwing in pebbles near the shore, out it came. And though the discrepancy this time was insignificant, it somehow brought us all in a second face to face with the inevitable and dreaded climax. And so I tramped all over that little bit of an island, hoping he might somehow have gotten in without my knowing it, and always thinking, I heard that awful last cry of his in the darkness, and then the night dropped down impenetrably like a damn thick blanket out of the sky, and all eyes fell away from his face. Hank poked up the logs with his boot and Morris seized an ember in his bare fingers to light his pipe, although it was already emitting clouds of smoke. But the professor caught the ball flying. I thought you said he sank without a cry, he remarked quietly, looking straight up into the frightened face opposite, and then riddling mercilessly the confused explanation that followed. The cumulative effect of all these forces hitherto so rigorously repressed now made itself felt, and the circle spontaneously broke up, everybody moving at once by a common instinct. The professor's wife left the party abruptly with excuses about an early start next morning. She first shook hands with Rushton, mumbling something about his comfort in the night. The question of his comfort, however, devolved by force of circumstances upon myself, and he shared my tent. Just before wrapping up in my double blankets, for the night was bitterly cold, he turned and began to explain that he had a habit of talking in his sleep and hoped I would wake him if he disturbed me by doing so. Well, he did talk in his sleep, and it disturbed me very much indeed. The anger and violence of his words remain with me to this day, and it was clear in a minute that he was living over again some portion of the scene upon the lake. I listened, horror-struck for a moment or two, and then understood that I was face to face with one of two alternatives. I must continue an unwilling eavesdropper, or I must waken him. The former was impossible for me, yet I shrank from the latter with the greatest repugnance, and in my dilemma I saw the only way out of the difficulty and at once accepted it. Cold though it was, I crawled stealthily out of my warm sleeping bag and left the tent, intending to keep the old fire alight under the stars and spend the remaining hours till daylight in the open. As soon as I was out, I noticed at once another figure moving silently along the shore. It was Hank Milligan, and it was plain enough what he was doing. He was examining the holes that had been cut in the upper ribs of the canoe. He looked half ashamed when I came up with him, and mumbled something about not being able to sleep for the cold. But there, standing together beside the overturned canoe, we both saw that the holes were far too small for a man's hand and arm and could not possibly have been cut by two men hanging on for their lives in deep water. Those holes had been made afterwards. Hank said nothing to me, and I said nothing to Hank, and presently he moved off to collect logs for the fire which needed replenishing. 
for it was a piercingly cold night and there were many degrees of frost. Three days later, Hank and Silver Fizz followed with stumbling footsteps the old Indian trail that leads from Beaver Creek to the southwards. A hammock was slung between them, and it weighed heavily, yet neither of the men complained, and indeed, speech between them was almost nothing. Their thoughts, however, were exceedingly busy, and the terrible secret of the woods which formed their burden weighed far more heavily than the uncouth, shifting mass that lay in the swinging hammock and tugged so severely at their shoulders. They had found it in four feet of water, not more than a couple of yards from the lee shore of the island, and in the back of the head was a long, terrible wound which no man could possibly have inflicted upon himself. Before your next story, rate us five stars on iTunes. We count on your tweets and reviews to help us bring our stories to the largest number of readers possible. Visit share.morningshort.com to invite your family and friends to listen to stories from Morning Short. Learn more about the Morning Short Project and sign up for our daily emails at morningshort.com.